and welcome to the Inside Source Executive Video Series. My name is Dawn Evans. I'm CEO of Sourcing Interest Group, and I am so excited to introduce you to Colonel Banks today. Let me tell you a little bit about Colonel Banks. He's a Deputy De Department Head COO of the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Leadership at West Point and has a PhD. The man has so many credentials, and we are so excited to welcome you to the show today. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. In the military, you almost say you have a formula for developing leaders. You've said that. What is your secret? Really, it's just a conscious focus on developing the whole person. So when we take a look at how leaders actually come to be, it's not just because they've had a formal title bestowed upon them. It's that they've learned how to operate in such a way that leadership is truly who they are, not just the role they enact. So we take a look at not only the disparate set of experiences as you have rotational job assignments, but also a conscious focus on developing their values as they progress throughout their career. And by looking at both competence and character and providing them a disparate set of experiences, we create individuals that are adaptive and able to lead our organizations well. Very good. So a couple weeks ago, you and I had a conversation and you brought up a, a brilliant point and you said, you know, we would take Eisenhower and Patton, two amazing leaders, but if they were reversed during the war, the outcome of the war could have been dramatically different. And yet we need both kinds of leadership styles in, in corporate America. So how do you get the right leadership in the right place? Or, or could an Eisenhower become a Patton and vice versa? Or are you always inherently one type of leader? It's not that you're always inherently one type of leader because you exercise different styles and different roles. But you have to understand self well before you start changing the manner in which you enact self. So for example, there are times when an organization needs somebody who is more forceful in their approach, uh, somebody who's more visionary because what the organization requires at that stage of its development is an individual with those characteristics mm -hmm. as opposed to an individual who's going into more of a caretaker role, whereas that kind of person needs to be more steady in their approach because to be disruptive in an organization that is very, very high performing might not best suit the needs of the people in the organization at that time or what the organization's challenged to do. So it's important to adopt different styles over time, but your style should always reflect a staunch adherence to the values of the organization and your personal values as well. And what are the personal values every leadership, every person in leadership position should have? Well, you know, that's interesting because your personal values have to be aligned with your corporate values. It's not to say that one must be just your corporate values, but everyone has to have their values in alignment with the corporate values. So in the Army, for example, we have seven core values. Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. You can add to those, but you can never detract from them. I would say that those seven should be there no matter what, don't you think, and even in a corporate vision and in corporate values? It can be as assumed that yes, those are universal values, but how people enact those can be very different based on cultural mores and some other things. For example, duty. So we take duty as not just duty to the army, but duty to the nation, to our duly elected officials, and also to the Constitution of the United States. Whereas in another organization, duty can also be, it's all about your responsibility to the shareholder. And so you always must do that, which is in their best interest. So even though you have the same value, let's say, how that value is defined and then enacted can be very different. So you mentioned earlier in, in your talk this morning that 37 minutes into a cadet's life at West Point, they're handed a card that said, um, you will not, I will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate anyone else who does so. And yet, those are core values that we should be raising our children with. Do you, is this because by the time they get to West Point, you've taken the best of the best and they've all been raised with those values? Or is it something that literally has to still be instilled in people's nature? It has to be instilled. Because even though we pick people who are very highly accomplished, the stark reality is that when you talk to individuals today, many of them were brought up in environments where even though we know cheating is wrong, they grew up in a culture where if you're not cheating, you're not trying. Mm. And so when you talk to kids today, they will tell you, hey, you're taught to learn how to take shortcuts. Whether that's, you know, you have your smartphone with you in class and you Google something real quick or or, you know, you tell half-truths in the hopes of giving the best possible presentation. 
And so even though we bring in very accomplished people, we cannot make the assumption that they all grew up in environments where duty, honor, country, a cadet will not lie, cheat or steal, nor tolerate those who do, is a part of who they are. For many individuals, they'll say, listen, I understand that it's wrong for me to lie, but who am I to tell somebody else that they can't do that? Whereas we have to teach them that you have to go that extra step because it's not just about you. If you see wrongdoing in your organization, you have an obligation as a leader to do something about it. And so that toleration piece is probably the most difficult thing we have to wrestle with because we do bring in kids who've been taught it's wrong to do those things. But many of them have not been acculturated to understand they have a moral obligation to go after those who are doing those wrong things. So if people, if we think about you know, some major failures here in the United States, corporate-wide, you know, the companies had great, great values, they had great mission statements, they had their value statements, they were out there, and the companies still were corrupted by people from the inside. So how can we get, how can we build a culture in a corporation where the leaders actually are living those values? Is it in who we choose or is it the pressure we put on people? It's part of who we choose, it's part of how we measure. Okay. You know, in most performance evaluations, there's no conscious discussion about how are your actions consistent with the values of this organization. We only look at outcomes. We don't look at how individuals are going about achieving those outcomes and force managers to have those difficult conversations with their employees. But those are conversations that must transpire at every level in the organization if you are to create a culture whereby individuals understand we will conduct business in a manner that is consistent with our espoused values. Interesting. So if I have a culture and I, and I want everyone to aspire to be a leader, do you believe that everyone can be a leader? Absolutely. Okay, so if I want to develop a culture, I want everyone to be a leader, and, I, and if a leader fails, I want someone to be able to immediately step in to take over that leadership role, and yet you can't have a company run by all leaders. Somebody has to follow. Somebody has to take direction. So how do you balance it, especially in the military? I mean, you're out in the field, and someone literally is, is fallen, mm -hmm. and someone has to immediately step in the role, and yet up until that moment, they were taking orders from that person. So how do you get someone who now can now step into the role of a leader and yet be a follower and a doer at the same time? You, you have to understand that the two are next to be linked. Many times we view leadership as a role, where it's a way of being. And sometimes the way in which you act as a leader is by being a good follower. So that I know that my act of leadership, if leadership by definition is creating direction, gaining alignment, and maintaining commitment, if I can understand the direction in which the organization is going, align my own efforts with that and maintain my commitment to enacting my role in the best possible way, even if I'm not in the formal position of authority, the manner in which I'm conducting myself and encouraging those around me to conduct themselves, that is an act of leadership. Mm -hmm. And so when I do step into that formal role, I now know that because I will seek to create that direction, alignment, maintain commitment, and foster that in those around me, that it's easy to transition into that role because it's always the way in which I act, whether I'm in that formal leadership role or whether I'm formally in the role of a follower. Do you ever have leaders that need to not lead, to, uh, to be asked to step down, and, and then can you reshape them into growing back into leaders? Absolutely. So that is why we put individuals in developmental assignments, to stretch them. And sometimes they're going to fail in those assignments. And in those failures, we create the space for meaningful conversations oriented on their dialogue. Because if we believe we've gone out and sourced the best talent, why would we want to discard them the first time they encounter failure? So we believe that it, failure is a natural part of growth. You know, I was telling somebody earlier that when you grow a muscle, it's a conscious decision to tear the muscle. And that as leaders, what you're trying to do continually is to engage in a series of controlled tears. Tear it too little, you don't get stronger. Tear it too much, it's irreparable. But you tear it just enough, the muscle actually gets stronger. And so leaders in their organization should always be engaged in a series of experiments designed to consciously tear the organization in the hopes that what comes back as a result of that is stronger. And so failure is a natural part. You know, when you lift weights, you lift until failure. And it's the same thing in organizations. If you want to get better, you're gonna have to push the organization to where it experiences failure, just like in science experiments. In a science experiment, what you're not trying to do is to find the truth. So every time you do the experiment, you're not hoping that you come upon the correct answer. Science is all about eliminating the wrong answers so that all that is left is the distillation of truth. 
And so when you experiment out in organizations, every time you engage in an activity, if it goes wrong, instead of saying, oh my God, we screwed that up. Instead, we might say, well, we know that that didn't work. And so now we can go about the next experiment in a little different way, armed with that knowledge. Organizations that understand that have a much higher probability of being successful than those that are only looking for the right answer. So you have two children, one about ready to enter at West Point, and then a younger child at home, right? Oh, we've got five children. You have five? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I only heard stories about two. Oh, my goodness. Yes, no, we have five children, 17, 14, 9, 8, and 7. So two boys, oh, three Oh, my girls. goodness. Okay, well, there are a lot more stories in there that I need to get to. I only knew about two of them. There are a lot of stories. But you have a son going into West Point. We do. And we do. was that a lifelong dream of yours? Uh, you know, it was not a lifelong dream of mine, nor would I dare to dream for my children. Our dream yeah. was only to help empower their dreams. And so for my son, it was not something that he had had as a goal for a long time. It was only in the last year that he started to consider West Point as his college choice. Uh, we were thankful that he had a number of good schools to select from. So he had some Ivy League acceptances and some other great schools in New York. But when it came down to it, he chose West Point because he was drawn to the values of the institution. He was drawn to the way in which the institution embraces its members throughout the duration of their lifetime and the, uh, the bonds that are forged as a result of attending that institution. So we're excited for him, but once again, it's his journey. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to live vicariously through him, but I, I'm very proud of him for the young man very he proud. is. Very proud, very proud. Anyone who'll go into service for our country, I, we're so proud of them. You've had an amazing career so far. So what's on the horizon for you? I know you're, you're at West Point, you're gonna retire a Brigadier General but there's some space in there. So what should we expect? Uh, so for the there? next seven years, we're just proud to be part of a team that's trying to continue to push the envelope with respect to leader development, not only for the United States Army, but also for the nation. You know, as you know, we have many challenges ahead of us, and we believe that America can overcome those challenges, but it's gonna take individuals who once again live their lives as leaders, not just view themselves as leaders when they're in select roles. So figuring out how we can do that better, continuing to evolve our practices, and being happy to be a part of something that truly is a national treasure. And to think in collective terms, that's a, a challenge we're very excited about. Are you proud of, of the work you've done every day in developing these leaders? I am very proud of the young men and women we produce. And I'm glad to have been a part of something that's much larger than myself. And West Point seems to, be, seems to treat everybody equally. I mean, it, it's not... It's not race driven, it's not male versus female. It seems like they give, truly give equal opportunity to develop these leaders. Is that true? It's a very egalitarian place. It, it represents the absolute best ideas that form this country. And so it is a place where the things brilliantly expressed by the founders of our country in the Declaration of Independence truly comes to manifest itself in the daily practices of those who reside on those hallowed grounds. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm proud to have made your acquaintance, and I, I really appreciate your time today. We are out of time, but I'm just very so impressed, and you were just wonderful for our audience today, too, so thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. It's been great to be here. Thank you. And this is Don Evans. I'll see you next time on our executive video series. Have a good day.